Well, a very good morning. Thank you for watching The Morning Breeze here at the Political Command Center. My name is Simon Kagwanjala. We are into the edition of the topical discussion. And our focus now is on the outlook of the economy. As the country emerges from um, a, a very tough season of elections, in the midst of a pandemic with lots of things also happening, uh, there are stories that had actually gone off the radar. The Bank of Uganda scandal, uh, we, we've seen of late, uh, the, 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 the governor's contract has been renewed, but there is also an elephant in the room called the DTB um, uh, case uh, that, that uh, shook the ground uh, last year. Could, could this be spilling over into the new year? And uh, there is also a budget framework paper that was uh, yesterday tabled before parliament the big highlight in this framework paper is about uh, cars, billions that are going to be blown uh, to purchase cars for our distinguished honorable members of parliament. What does the election, rather, what does the economy look like in the midst of all these challenges? I'm joined by experts this morning, actually sandwiched. Uh, Ramadan Gobi is a senior economist and lecturer at Makere University Business School and an advisor to the president on matters of the economy. I'm also joined by Julius Mukunda from the Civil Society Budget Advocacy Group. This is your time. Around this time, you, you, you have a lot of activity. Mm -hmm. But gentlemen, thank you for joining me and a very good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Pleasure to be here. Happy New Year. Happy New Year. <coughs> is it possible to assess the impact uh, elections and politics has had on the economy in recent weeks? Oh, yeah. Um, thank you, Simon. First of all, you need to remember that these elections came uh, in, in, in the midst of the pandemic of COVID, when the economy had already been battered by that COVID for, uh, throughout the year 2020. We expected a growth of 6.5%. We got 3%, 3.1% to be precise. And uh, with the election now coming in, uh, it has distorted and disrupted most of the activities. And therefore, you expect that uh, uh, boss has not yet uh, released the, 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 the third quarter, but you expect that it's going to be uh, more on a downward kind of uh, trend. Because definitely... But I thought elections are a spending season. Um, ideally, but uh, in, in this particular one, and, and, and actually even uh, the, the others in the past, they have also been disrupting the, the activities. And uh, you know Uganda's economy is so small and concentrated in, in the center where most of the chaos and the, all these arguments take place. So uh, you should expect that uh, when uh, all these uh, tear gas arrests, people running around, people staying home, violence you saw uh, in November, a lot of you know, percentages of GDP yeah. go off. And then on the election day, about uh, actually two days before and about four days after, the entire country was almost shut, no internet. Um, uh, and the uh, social media up to now. Mm. And you know, uh, ICT has been one of the key drivers of our growth in recent years. Mm. Uh, so, uh, the, the, plus the wait and see kind of mode in which these elections put Uganda, because no investor would dare, especially portfolio investors, mm. would dare bring money at a time when um, everywhere politicians are swearing, you know, <laughs> at each other. <laughs> and the population is responding also with a, uh, a lot of fear mongering. Uh, we are going to die. And others are telling you, actually, we are dying. So just imagine, Simon, you were out of Uganda. And you, you are getting Uganda's information on, on your computer and on CNN and, and the BBC, what they were showing, Al Jazeera, would you pick your money and take it to, or bring it to Uganda? <laughs> it would be difficult. So 
Portfolio investments must have gone down. Remittances must have reduced. FDI in, in form of other you know, investments, equity and so on, must have gone down. And these are the drivers of most of our... Uganda is a capital uh, deficit country. Well, Julius, mm -hmm. uh, by, by, uh, by uh, Ramadan submission, things look a bit bleak. But is this something that is really getting to the core of the ordinary person? Uh, and I think that's, for me, that has been our biggest challenge, that we tend to take these things very lightly. Or oh, academically? Yeah, we say these are civil society guys, these are academicians. It, 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 is, it is them that, that, uh, that are trying to hyper, to hyper these. But also it is because you find that an ordinary person, you know, like a farmer, sometimes, I mean, you've been making losses, but you still continue digging and... And producing and producing and producing food, not not knowing that if things up were correct and done well, the the, the livelihood, the indicators at the, at the local at the local level would also would, would also improve. Let me take an example. If we don't have all these disruptions and we have increased the demand, for example, for uh, our, our 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 goods and services, that would mean that. Down at the grassroots level, you have farmers producing to sell to the market, and then the market is channeling that uh, outside Uganda and the rest. So there, is, there would be income at, at the low government level. So it's really very, very serious that when we talk about the disruptions, it means that much to an ordinary person. If an investor who is trying to make a decision uh, this year sees all this picture and this disruption and postpones that decision, it would mean that there is so much at stake. But actually, even internally, you find that people wanted to, to do business, to start a business this financial year, like, okay, let's hold until the elections are over. What does that mean? It means that goods and services they were supposed to buy, if you have to start a factory, maybe you want to, to, produce, to, to buy cement, or you want to start producing uh, a certain agricultural product and add value, uh, uh, add value to it, then all that decision uh, stays. You, you uh, seem you, to be you wearing to... different lenses. Mm -hmm. The president has severely come out to say that Uganda's economy is on a steady path and it's weathered the vagaries of <clears throat> COVID-19. Uh, could, could this be treated as a, one of those political rhetorics? To, to, I mean, one of the things we can also understand is that we thought actually that COVID was going to completely you know, remove uh, completely diminish our economy or put us on the standstill, even go, even go to negatives, because the, or the global economy is expected to contract. But Uganda were expected to, to slightly uh, grow at 3.1%, at, at 3, at 3 like Roma had, has, has said. Why? Let's just ask why. I think for me, I've already said that it's because most of, we are not, not so many people are engaged in this international business in Uganda. So you have this farmer, whether the prices have increased or have, have not increased, he still has uh, the, the motivation to go and produce and eat and feed his family. So at that level, you find that agricultural production actually was, despite COVID, was one of the sectors that had a steady, uh, a steady growth because you have these, you know, uh, we are an agricultural producing country and as such, you have these farmers who can still produce anyway. So that is one thing that makes our economy a bit uh, resilient in terms of these, uh, in, ter in terms of the outside, uh, outside force, economic forces. But it is very important to note that if the situation was different, was better, we could also be doing, uh, doing better. So when the president says, oh, we are back, we are resilient and good, I don't think he means that uh, we are better than before. I, I, my interpretation is that he means that uh, we would have been worse, but here we are. We are not as worse as, uh, as we thought. And, and I, I, that's where I, I would take it. What kind of conversation should the country be having post-election? Number one, we need uh, not even a conversation, but action on pulling the median person out of this trough where the pandemic has dumped that median Ugandan. And I'm talking a person who's working in an informal setting you, uh, within the urban area, 
uh, working in a market as a market vendor, working on the street as a street vendor, a younger person trying to work in a, an ICT uh, kind of kiosk, a younger lady who is trying to vend some items, a younger man working in a garage or in a, a carpentry and so on. I think government needs to find money and recapitalize this person. Uganda is a, a very, you know, is a country to recover economically. Why? Because our marginal propensity to consume is very high. The proportion of income which people spend on consumption is quite high. It's about, according to UBOS, about 81%. What does that mean? For those who have attended basic economic classes will tell you, when you have a, a high marginal propensity to consume, mm government spent one shilling, that shilling will multiply several times. For Uganda, if you work out the simple math, our multiplier is about five, above five, which means that every shilling which government spends now in the economy would, would multiply itself five times, would generate a multiplier effect of five times. For instance, if we got a hundred billion shillings, and we spend it on recovering the informal economy right now, you can easily be sure that within a year, you have created some more than 500 billion shillings. Within just a small you know, economy, say in the central business district of Kampala or in the greater Kampala metropolitan area. So action, no more conversations on that front. Then when you go to where the majority of Ugandans are in the rural economy, we know what drives that rural economy is agriculture. And at this point, most of the farmers need two things. They need markets and they need inputs to produce more. <coughs> and this is where now um, you need as government to work with the private sector and find means of, because you know, <coughs> regionally and globally, we, they need food. And we have this food in the gardens of Uganda. But it, because of the disruptions of COVID and elections, the markets have been not forthcoming. And this is where now you need to come in and sort out the marketing aspect, and then the inputs of good quality, ensuring that they seamlessly reach the farmers to produce more. To me, I think uh, this is, should be a time of action. Mm. We have spoken and spoken a lot of these things. But uh, look at our fiscal position also. Our fiscal position tells me that uh, perhaps the Treasury is also not as happy as in every other Ugandan because the Treasury depends on this economy. Um, the fact that tax revenues have dwindled. Uh, you remember Simon, the Ministry of Finance revised downward the targets for URA by nearly four trillion shillings. They didn't collect that, or they are not going to collect it by the end of this financial year. Much as they have been announcing a few uh, of those surpluses in collections, it's on account of revised uh, targets. So you need, therefore, as a government, especially in this fourth quarter, to cut out some austerity measures on the government itself. Where do you spend the money? And uh, to me, I, I saw yesterday you were showing us on the news that now the main item is how to facilitate the new parliament. With 300 million. The good thing is that that parliament is not going to be there until after May and it will be in place for only one month of the old year, financial year. Let us use the last quarter of this financial year to finance economic recovery instead of mm -hmm. consumption. In, in the midst, of, before I actually get to Julius, in the midst of this grim reality of things happening, mm -hmm. government looks bent on spending, one, 
Two, the Bank of Uganda governor has been reappointed. Mm. Uh, while the, the economists and several other, several other uh, analysts have argued that uh, there is quite a lot that ought to be done mm. by the central bank. G give us your take. Um, personally, my opinion on the governor of the central bank is good enough is on record. I, I, I've written uh, several about, uh, about Governor Mutebile and his economics. You know, he's unapologetically a neoliberal, very strong neoliberal monetarist. Mm. At one time, he told us, let those <coughs> with the eyes to swear money is, amass it. When I asked him, what about those without eyes? He said, let them die. <laughs> no one, you know, owes them a living. Bold. So, yeah, he's that guy who believes, is a typical monetarist, you know, a Milton Friedman uh, kind of disciple. And uh, I myself, I, I don't believe in that economics, the trickle-down economics. I, I believe that economics needs to be, you know, almost like advocacy, especially in economies of our... Uh, a structure where there are very few people with those eyes to see where your money is. <laughs> you know, uh, in other words, those who can use the markets to, 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 to take advantage of the economy. You need a lot of affirmative action in economies of our type. So uh, I've been historically uh, not agreeable with the Mr. Mutebile's economics, but he has also been a, a stabilizer when it comes to macroeconomy. His economics has given Uganda stability mm -hmm. at a macro level for many years, and characteristically. That's why you see uh, he has been uh, severally uh, uh, voted at international level and regional <laughs> level as one of the best governors mm -hmm. of the central bank. Uh, uh, one time I said, you know, he's a genius, and he, and he should be in the Guinness Book of Records for uh, solving problems that he has created. To me, I think uh, macroeconomic stability in Uganda, we need to look at it broadly. But he's been at the helm <coughs> of an institution that is now viewed in some bad light uh, when it comes to some of the yeah, decisions. Yeah, uh, I, I was actually beginning from his stronger points mm. and coming to the weaker ones. Mm. Um, he has stabilized inflation for many years. Uh, before he came, uh, uh, to become a governor, Uganda had a very, very bad history of hyperinflation because of uh, the way we were managing our monetary policy. There was a lot of printing money and throwing it in the economy. Him and uh, Keith Muhakanizi and the late Kasami, they have worked to, to stabilize the macroeconomy. That one, you can't take it away from them. Mm. But then, over years, I think... Mr. Mutebire lost the grip of things and he allowed the system uh, to be the one which is driving him instead of him driving the system. And for that reason, you find that the central bank, which we thought was uh, a place of, uh, of efficiency, of no corruption, and so on and so forth, was exposed recently, as every Ugandan knows, by the way uh, they, 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 they handled the issue of bank closures mm -hmm. and other, among other things. So, um, but again, when, you, when something has not completely broken, mm -hmm. you don't fix it. I think President Museven <laughs> is looking at, should I change the head of the central gov governor at a time when myself, I've just been voted back and I need to first of all have this stability before I think of how do we uh, get to another level. And in any case, he has just voted, I mean appointed, a new depu deputy governor who was a senior researcher at the bank. And I think uh, uh, there is some bit of stability at the bank. He wouldn't want to, you know, test a lot the waters with both legs. He would want to first see uh, how the, the new deputy governor, because he knows he's the one in charge, 
cause Mr. Mtebire, uh, Mtebire's health has deteriorated over years. Uh, is rarely even at the bank. But when he appears, he knows Mutebira is very, very astute on, on what, what needs to be done and is a decision maker. Well, thank you. Uh, weigh in on uh, the reappointment of Governor Mutebira. Uh, yes. Uh, uh, the <coughs> scandal ridden bank. Yes, but, but also on the conversation of what should happen, um, uh, on what the new government is supposed to be doing, one of the biggest things they're supposed to fix is, is also about uh, our spending priorities where the money should go. He mentioned something around consumptive expenditure. This coming budget, entire almost you know, half of it, is going on, on consumptive items. So you just can't spend like that and you expect that you're going to recover the economy. You look at these districts that we have, even their budgets, you know, their budgets have, have reduced. So if you want to look at the frontline service delivery points and you are not facilitating them to deliver services correctly, instead actually you're even uh, reducing funding, I think that's going to be our biggest problem. For, I think for Mutebele for me is the, a number of scandals have happened at the Bank of Uganda. But the ability of the bank to fix itself, I think for me is one of the, of the strengths they have. It's one of the institutions I, 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 I do respect because of the role they play in our economy. The ability of the bank to, you know, to get back some institutions, if they get such a huge scandal, then you will know that they are, they, are, they are finished. But I think it's because of, 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 of Mutebele being at the helm to know that, okay, we've messed up. Can we please bring the house to order back? I think that ability is one thing probably... Will present. things get any better? Yes. I, 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 I believe where, where we are coming from, where, where and, where, and the, the picture of Bank of Uganda itself, I think the management of Bank of Uganda currently, I would not, uh, I would not really question it, considering the kind of deputy governor they are having, because the moment they had almost like six to nine months without a deputy governor, they have a deputy governor, but even when the deputy governor was not there, you would not feel that the Bank of Uganda was not uh, executing its mandate. So, so we can give them a benefit of doubt. I give them a benefit of, of, of doubt uh, because they have... Systems can also sometimes betray you, like what happened uh, with the closure, of bank, the, the closure of some of the banks. But also, I think one of the things that Mutebele needs to look out for is uh, who is overseeing the overseer. If, if you are closing the bank, how do you ensure that it is done properly? Apart from you just doing it yourself and you are assured that it has been done for inactivity. I think that's one of the reforms they need to look, to look, out, to, to look out for. That if the bank is going to execute an, a mandate, who is going to oversee to ensure that it has done it properly and according uh, to, to, uh, to the right procedure? Does the reappointment abdicate him of the errors or of the wrongs that he committed? <sighs> that, I think, is for the appointing, it's for the appointing authority. But maybe we could, we could also ask, don't we, do we have other materials in this country who, could have, who can do a better job? That, that, that could be a question. But I think to, in the eyes of the appointing authority, they felt that uh, he has really handled the, the institution uh, uh, very well. And I think the Bank of Uganda, if you really go in their records from their past history, considering the kind of economy we have, so fragile, you know, you have little FDI coming in, you have heavy expenditure pressures. Government, government that wants to spend all the time, and yet you have to control inflation, you have to control the exchange rates, you have to ensure that all the macros are stable, and you, st you still do that despite all the challenges that are there. I think well, I give them a credit. Uh, 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 Julius, mm. you could actually paint for us a picture of what this budget holds for 2021 22. You've looked, scanned through the, the, the budget framework. Mm. Where are the gray areas? Uh, where are the lines of hope? I think one of the lines for hope is for me is the program based budgeting that the, the program based approach that has been brought in. Whereby now they, they are trying to bring all these government agencies and say, please, there is one area that we need to deliver on. Can we all ensure that we do that? Uh, instead of spending money on how many children we have enrolled in school, can we say we want pass rates? We want children to complete 
uh, primary seven. So what do we need? What can we do? Water, what can you do? Health, what can you do? Uh, education, what can you do? Instead of implementing in the zeros as if we bring to different government. This is, it is still a problem because of, uh, of mindset change, because some sectors, for example, you find, uh, you know, KCC wants to have industrial parks, you got an investment authority wants to have industrial parks, you have the zonal authority, they also want to develop industrial parks, so there is that still a lot of duplication, but I think the idea, the idea is good. The, the, most, uh, the other part, of course, what we need now to worry about, of course, is debt. I think one of the biggest challenges we face is that uh, you have increased spending pressures. The budget actually has also uh, increased uh, around 45.6 trillion, but our revenues are, are, are reducing. So it is forcing government now to go and, 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 and borrow more. Borrowing wouldn't be a problem, but of course is that with our history and experience, we have found out that actually managing projects and loans has become, has become a challenge. So fixing that, so that we get better returns, so that we recover better, uh, quicker than, 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 than projected, would be, a very good, would be a very good thing. So government needs to fix project uh, 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 implementation. As we get into the new budget here, <clears throat> what kind of track record do we have on the past budget? Wow. On the outgoing budget? Oh. Now, with, with COVID, really, and all the supplementary expenditures that were happening almost on a, on a, on a, on a, on a monthly basis. But really, for this financial year for me is, let us say we should be very lucky if we all survive in terms of life. And begin to, to, to plan again, because COVID distorted everything. Consider it spending money for education, children are not in school. So what does that mean? Health is crippling with managing the pandemic. Uh, and by the way, health, I, there is, they have one big issue they haven't answered. Accountability of, for COVID fund. If a government report comes out and says you mismanaged and you are the ministry in charge of that fund and you have not come out officially to to say, okay, we did not mismanage, this is our report, so that the public can be able to compare. It could be one of the another big challenge that we're going to face, because if these donors gave us their money to manage COVID and mismanage them, if they pull the plug in the midst of where we are, it's going to be, it's going to be a nice one. Well, Ramadan, I wonder whether you familiarized yourself with the budget framework paper as yet. Yes. What does it have for us in the park, and uh, what picture does it give of the of the future uh, for the first time we are moving away from budgeting for sectors budgeting for ministries to spend and now we are budgeting for programs as Julius has said which uh, the national development plan three uh, put together there are 18 programs of them and for the first time the budget is structured that way from the first program of security and governance, which is taking the lion's share of the budget, mm. down to the last program of restructuring government itself, because there is a program on implementation of the plan. So it, it's a fantastic structure for me. The challenge comes when uh, you look at uh, where are we spending, our, or where are our priorities in terms of budgeting, vis-a-vis -vis the priorities in terms of planning. The planners prioritized, number one, agro-industrialization as a program. It's the priority number one. Because the National Development Plan 3 is anchored on enhancing household incomes, pulling Ugandas, Ugandans and their incomes, up so that we can achieve middle income status. That thing we have been talking about mm. over years. We, we thought we would achieve it last year, according to planners, but uh, we are still about 250, you know, Is the budget that. driving us to, into that direction? Yes, the, the, the kind of framework which has been put together is really uh, geared towards that. Is it realistic? Um, I think, it is, in the sense that 
the, it, it shows you that it is careful with the, our fiscal position. We don't have enough money to be ambitious. And it is more or less, actually, the same level of discretionary spending like this year we are going to end. So for the first time, the appetite of government to increment the budget you know, <laughs> has been tamed, has been tamed <laughs> by That's COVID and Ooh. these other realities. So you find that the discretionary budget is actually less, a bit less than by, by something like a, a few billions than this year's. For the first time, you don't see this curve which was on an upward trend in terms of government appetite. It has been a bit tame. We are looking at 45.6. Yes, yes. Mm -hmm. From 40. And a huge chunk of it is consumptive, right? <clears throat> no, a huge chunk of it is actually going to uh, what we, uh, debt repayment and others refinancing. Mm -hmm. You know, when you hear this debt refinancing, it's about rollover. You were supposed to pay Simon from whom you borrowed last year, but you are not in a position to pay him. So what do you do? You roll it over, you extend the debt, and you pay Simon more interest that year. That's what government, when you look at this framework, a lot of money is in that area. Is this an area where there is need for scrutiny uh, in debt repayment? Maybe it is used as a window uh, for some bit of corruption. Mm -hmm. um, no, I no. think we, we put our ambition is so high at the beginning. When we discovered the oil, and we got this feeling that by 20, <laughs> about 2018, 2016, 18, we shall be having oil. Remember the first mm -hmm. uh, kind of uh, projections. We started to front load that oil by borrowing a lot of money to build infrastructure. These brand new roads you saw all over the country, Uganda has been like a construction site for many years now, about six, seven years. And this is borrowed money, most of, the, of them. The dams to generate electricity, borrowed money. Plus, of course, some which our people, you can't rule out the, the corruption, they steal some, but a lot of this money was borrowed to, build, to, to bridge the infrastructure gap. And now reality hit us when the oil delayed, and we are supposed to repay these debts. The good thing is, much of this debt is internal and also multilateral. There is a window for rescheduling the multilateral mm -hmm. and also for rolling over the internal debt. These ones, you know, Bank of Uganda issuing a paper on behalf of government. Now, when you go to the big chunk of money is within that domestic debt refinancing. That word, wherever you see it, just know government is unable to pay for those papers and it is paying the interest. It's rolling over that debt. But going back a bit, uh, Simon, to where our framework paper is, you find that they have gone into the five key objectives mm -hmm. of the National Development Plan. And these are around value addition, enhancing value addition, strengthening private sector, uh, using or adding on our infrastructure by getting the quality of it, especially electricity, transmitting it, and also enhancing productivity of a special agriculture, and now changing the role of the state. The state is no longer going to sit at the fence and say this is a private sector-led economy. You are going to see more roles played by the likes of Uganda Development Corporation, the investment arm of government. And to me, this is good news. Because what we need now is to put more money in wealth creation, job and wealth creation areas. And we know them, agro-industry, let us not just speak it. But I'm a bit sick with that budget I've looked at. Still, agro-industry is given about 1.2.5 trillion. Mm. That's, those are peanuts. We need a big bang in terms of getting this sector <coughs> to move. Yeah. I've seen it's also some money put for manufacturing. Very little. Actually, there are very few billions. How, how, how much, uh, uh, Julius? Very, very few. 
Yes. The assumption here is that the private sector will bring the money. No, industry is driven everywhere by the state. Mm. You have to first de-risk the manufacturing for so private sector to come in. 52 billion. Again, <laughs> are we looking at uh, a budget billion. where security will again eat the lunch? Oh, yeah. <laughs> the security is up there. It's number one. Number one priority. Then you have government itself. Because you see government has grown bigger when you see the members of parliament. Mm. The other day you saw on your TV, you were telling us now every Ugandan is governed by, yeah. I mean, every 16 Ugandans it's governed. are governed by one person. <laughs> Uganda is over-governed. And that has a bill attached on it. So we needed to restructure government. We need to swallow something. This circus we are going on with that we can every five years go to the polls and uh, elect more members of parliament, get more councillors, get more district chairpersons by creating more of these units, it's not going to work. It has turned politics into the only lucrative business. That's why now you see, because government has taken the money away from certain sectors where people used it to work, mm. they have moved away from those sectors and they have joined the politics. I don't know who is going to sing for us because now all the musicians are going. I don't know who is going to, 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 to do comedy. Comedians are joining <laughs> politics. Everywhere you see that the younger people have lost hope in the economy supporting them and they are looking for that is a money by going into. So this is something which to me needs to be reversed by just using incentives. Put money where the economy is then you will see people like grasshoppers. They follow light, and in this case, the light is money. Well, wh where are the key areas where you think this budget is going to spur the economy? When you told me that uh, security is eating the lion's share, how about agriculture, for instance? And, and, and uh, you see, I, I think that's the, 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 the mind. The, I, I was talking to one, uh, one general, and he's like, Julius, the issue is not anything but mindset change. When they said go back to programming, to program approach, everybody said, yeah, we are very fine, but you still budget for the same things. Agriculture still go to the, the least amount of money. If everything is anchored on agro-processing, adding value addition, uh, you know, increasing income to, at the household level, and we know that our major vehicle is agriculture, why are we giving it 1.5? I mean, again, that's pe peanuts. And by the 1.5, if we remove wage and non-wage, you end up <laughs> with only... Uh, half of that. So f for me is, uh, I, I, I really wanted to see m more money pumped in this particular area. The, the other area that for me is still a very big concern is digital transformation. Mm. I mean, digital transformation, I mean, 101 billion. Mm -hmm. That's pocket change for some, for some votes here in, in this country. And yet where we are heading to, by the way, is this digital, the digital world is the one that is going to, to help us survive. We needed to see more resources, more programs in the particular area, especially that we have a very younger population. Uh, we were discussing how I was uh, telling Rama before that I, I had not realized how many youth were having TVs on, on YouTube. And not these simple ones, by the way interviewing very important people in the country and getting their opinions, having very good programs on them, and they were earning money because some of them have got adverts. They were, they were generating income out of their own initiative. Mm. So if you don't want to support that particular sector and just give it peanut like that, then what, 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 what are you planning? I think, Simon, these are some of the things we need really to bring at the forefront of the new government and say we have a chance to, to reprioritize and say, where are our low-hanging fruits? The, the other element for me is about markets. If really we can't sell milk and eggs to Kenya, because we, we are a land of country, that's for sure, and we won't get to the sea, the seaport uh, mm -hmm. any, any time. I don't think so. We have issues with the, you know, with these trade barriers. What is what? What are our ambassadors doing in North America and West Africa? I think for me, the first assignment for an ambassador is to look for markets for their, for their countries. And I can agree, and I agree with Rama, let me tell you. These farmers, if you guarantee them bucket, 
just markets. Yeah. They would even look for their own pesticides. They would look for their own training. Even you, if they tell you that right now there is a market for pumpkins, let me tell you, we will rush back and start growing pumpkins because you know there is a real market for them. So for me, is, I, I think the issue of market is being taken very lightly. We need to see a serious investment in marketing our products because once you do that, let me tell you, that's our magic bullet in this country. Why we can't be heading to uh, Outside the hype that comes around this time, is the country realistic in the way it budgets? Sometimes, I th so when you look at the document, you really give it a tick. But I think the monster is in the implementation. Because when, when they tell you we're going to put up uh, PG uh, Sega Express Highway, you definitely know that the traffic jam in this Nushka country is likely to reduce. Yeah. You are like, wow, this is good. If they say, oh, we're going to transmit power, get it from Isimba and bring it to, to the area of consumption, who doesn't want that? If they tell you we're going to build a hospital, yes, it is needed. But they tell you that the road is going to be built, it takes six years for it to be commissioned. And you're like, okay, what happened? And then all of a sudden you hear, oh, well, we, we never thought about uh, the right of way. Come on, why did we ask for a loan if we knew we didn't have the right of way? So. The, the, the document is smart. The devil is in the, is, is in the implementation. And if we don't sort out the, in, in the implementation, that's the corruption you're talking about. That's where, it, that's where it comes from. Because it is in the, now actually, corruption isn't about people running to the treasure and people and running away. You plan for it properly in the document. Make sure money is appropriated by parliament legally and make sure you start the project to implement it when knowing that corruption is already embedded into that one. So it's very complicated. So, yes, the document is, is good, fantastic, the NBF, the, the National Budget Framework Paper. But when you come to, the, when the rubber hits the road, then you begin to argue, who bewitched this country? How couldn't you know that before a project is going to, is going to start, you need the right of way, you need to do the study. And these are the very simple things. But simply because somebody has rushed a loan process in the parliament, parliament passes it very quickly. When they come to the ground, they find you're not prepared. And you begin to pay commitment fees. Even on the loan, you have not actually, you have to have taken. So you can see that these problems are not, are not f from Mars. These are the normal problems we face on a daily, on daily lives. But these are the problems that can be solved and sorted out. And at times I ask myself, why not? Uh, Ramadan. The country was adversely hit by the COVID pandemic, and mm. we've also talked about uh, the downside of politics where spending has been the end of the day. Does the budget in any way speak to the austerity that you vouched for? No. Um, the natural one, yes. <laughs> the one which has been forced on them, <laughs> that one has been done. Because now the first thing when you look at that budget they have done, is to look at statutory spending mm. and cover it. And actually, even this year's budget, especially the second, uh, third, and I'm sure the fourth quarter, they have been, uh, you have seen some internal mm. memos, <laughs> I saw them on social media from Minister of Finance. Salary and other statutory obligations. Pensions and pay pension. Uh, give money to state house because the head of state must function, give money to parliament uh, for their allowances, and the local commission. <laughs> any other <laughs> when we get money. So we are like uh, this household now, or a family, that took for granted their cash flow. Realities, and they overspent on parties, <laughs> buying new dresses, suits, and so on. And then now reality hits them that the bank account, the inflow mm. is less and the outflow is quite huge. So you, you, you must start naturally, naturally, mm. naturally you, 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 you start now becoming a good husband at home. You go back early because there is no <laughs> more money for bars and so on. This is how government has been behaving. And uh, COVID, you know, COVID came to sort his us out a bit by bringing our uh, this rude awakening to the government. Going forward, 
I don't know whether we have learned enough <laughs> lessons. I'm, I'm, I'm waiting to see. Because um, with what we have already discussed, uh, government becoming too big, mm. you need to see a budget which now uh, talks more on the Rio Ugandan. Mm. Because, you know, we have budgeted a lot for things which are big up there, infrastructure, you know. We have mm. built the dams, the roads, the bridges. They are there. When you flash the pictures on TV here, Ugandans see them and the class say, oh, Uganda. But those things, they are useless and meaningless when your pocket is empty, when your wallet is empty. And this is where now most of the younger Ugandans are. Ah. And they have sent a very good message to government, <laughs> the way they have voted. <laughs> they went and ticked. They were about to tick government out of power. I want to tell you the truth. Mm. They, had, they, of course, ticked half of the cabinet out of power, half of parliament out of power, and uh, they have sent the kind of people who are real to them, who are next to them. Mm. They have been hustling together. And uh, this is where now, um, if I were in charge of this economy, where would I put more, more of the money? I would put it in the sectors which employ these real Ugandans. Yeah, yeah, but the, the sobering reality is government doesn't seem to have learned a thing or two. If you tell me that 300 million is going to be allotted to each MP yeah. when they enter... To power, buy cars. To buy cars. Mm. We, 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 government that, is still luxury. That is something I, I would first of all look at and uh, call all of this... Uh, parliament, because you see, we, we made a constitution. <laughs> Anything the executive does now to say, I'm not giving you this money for cars, you are breaking the constitution. You are violating the constitution. constitution. They can actually, parliament can connive and impeach you as executive. So you must sit down, the three arms of the state, and discuss. And this is the time, I think, before May. Before and, May. and that's why they give them that time to reflect we shouldn't really have a new government beginning in May with this business as usual. Mm. That they are going to allocate themselves 300 million to buy cars. That they are going to pay themselves 30 million shillings a month. That you are going to have uh, a, a cabinet of 80 people, a parliament of 500 plus people, and so on and so forth. These are realities now need to be discussed. Which type of a country do we need? And to me, this is the conversation Uganda should be having. Uh, not these other, you know, uh, things of democracy and do things. You see, when uh, you over-democratize, you create the kind of mess we are in. Because now we are allowed people to go and stand on the microphone and say, by the way, my people have told me they need their village to become also a district. And uh, by democracy, if people actually say this is all we want, then you say, oh, yes, let them have a district. Should we continue the, on this trajectory? To me, that's why I'm saying that you start with incentives. If you sat and say, Parliament, your budget is now 800 billion. Huh? Mm. At one time, you were at 200 billion. Mm. And you see, we, we, we over talk about parliament <laughs> as they are spending a lot of money. <laughs> and I'm, I think we're a bit unfair to them because 800 billion of 45 trillion, they will tell you that's not a lot of money. Where are you spending the other, all of those other trillions? <laughs> that's where we should look first. So look, talk to parliament with the, a reasonable now new future. Because, you know, some young people are telling me they were fighting for new Uganda. Mm. You can create a new Uganda within the old one. By bringing a new future, that shows you that, look, we want Uganda to be on another route to, progress, to prosperity. Mm. And in this way, we want to put more money in the following areas, pro-people areas. And you really, as executive, bring those pro-people proposals on table. And then the people themselves, you announce them to the population. But for us to be able to finance this, we must cut. Because a budget is like a piece of cloth. 
if you want to dress up a tall man and you have a small you know, um, piece of cloth, there is no way you're going to dress them up. As Parliament winds up business, do you think they are likely to focus more on making adjustments in this framework paper? Yeah. Or it's likely to be actually. Just if actually, if I were the executive, I would use this very parliament because half of it is not coming back. <laughs> it's not in their interest to to see a lot of good things happening to those who have defeated <laughs> them. <laughs> so I would use them to first sort out this mess to do this service. Uh, no, 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 to no, do no. service to, to the country and this service to their colleagues, mm. and they, they bring back some sanity because. You see, we allow the self-legislation, mm. self-interest legislation, mm. that members of parliament sit and they look at each other and they say, let us increase our salaries, salaries and allowances. And for that, there is no position. You don't see the other side of the aisle coming mm. up. And they agree, they, let us buy ourselves cars every year. So someone who has been in parliament for 20 years has gotten about th about to four cars, you know, brand new cars. Why should do that happen? Four wheel drive every four five years, and it's the same person. If there is a new person, maybe buy them a reasonable car. Many of them have never sat even in a, in some of these cars they want to to purchase now. Why why do you want to, to bring Julius, a show? Julius, as we get out of here, um. Uh, what key areas have you identified that would require some serious thinking and adjustment before yeah, the final oh, budget comes? Oh. I think first is let's deal with these administrative expenses of running a government. And I think Rama said, I, they, I was seeing it differently, but I think Rama brought it out and I said, this is the right parliament. Actually, mm. to put, for example, and say no more creation of districts, sub-counties, councils, and for the next 10 years. This is the right parliament to do that. Let them also say, once you don't do that, it then... Is, it is the, angry enough. Yes, it is angry enough. <laughs> I think that's one area that, that, that is really driving our, our bills so high. That, that's one key reform I want, I want government to do, the new government to do. The second one for me, which is very important also, is, and there are three, is, uh, is managing debt. I think debt management, soon, soon, soon something might give, might, might give way. Because we always say, oh, we are still below 50%, 50%. But now they are telling us that our, our, our uh, debt servicing to revenue ratio is now at 20%. And the borrowing appetite is just growing. I mean, and so... And even if you don't borrow, Simon, mm. COVID has already cut GDP by seven percentage points. So, so your debt has automatically ah, increased. increased. So f f for me, is, we need to, 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 you know, to, to hold it. And I think if we can do it well, we would be fine. Last year is, uh, is corruption. There is, there, there is no way I'm going to run out of this. There is no way we're going to run out of this. Does the budget address corruption in any way? Uh, I mean, apart from <laughs> facilitating the IGG and, and the CID, I have, I'm not seeing very strong actions that, you know, you know, on corruption. But is it because we lack that, or it is that we have not been able to... I, like I said, we have the right laws, we have the right policies, we have the right institutions. Why is it that the corruption, the corrupt get to go away with it? For if the next government does not seriously look at that, we are back to, uh, to normal business. Do your views matter on the budget? I guess they do. I guess they do. That's why uh, for the last 10 years, we, we still come here and, 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 and debate these issues. Otherwise, they would no longer be relevant. So every time I'm here, I'm sure a number of people are listening and, and jotting down some pen and say, okay, let's go and think about, it, uh, about, uh, about debt. The debt question actually is a very a huge debate now, simply because we've been talking about it and they've been saying, no, 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 we are okay, we are okay, we are okay. But now you meet people and say, okay, I think we need to look at it again. So, well, gentlemen, yes. thank you very much. I'm, I'm afraid <laughs> we're, we've run out of time. Uh, we have a youth MP um, candidates debate that's coming up. Uh, it's taking place right now at Serena Hotel. It's something that you, need, you really need to watch and see 
how our youth are faring and whether indeed we will be having the right crop of youth leaders debating national issues in parliament or whether we will have lukewarm uh, characters in parliament. <laughs> that should be coming up after the break. Good morning.